So in the 20 minutes we have remaining to us, we are still so, question. Um, is the test open note or? Um, the test is open note, but the test is also time. So you shouldn't plan on spending a lot of time thiefing through your notes, trying to find stuff. And I mean, the time limit isn't super tight. It will probably be two hours for 20 to 30 questions, but, but yes, you can use your notes if you want to. So after a kind of long detour with the limits. We're back to instantaneous rates of change. And we're interested for the moment in instantaneous rates of change at particular values. Like we could have a function f of x and want to know its instantaneous rate of change at two, something like that. It's been a while since we saw instantaneous rates of change. Let me remind you that there's another way to think of these objects. Instantaneous rates of change can also be thought of as the slopes of tangent lines. And we're in this case specifically interested in some fixed value x0 comma y0 and the tangent line is the line that kind of just rushes the curve at a point. The instantaneous rate of change probably needs less introduction. It's like, how quickly is something falling? How quickly is something growing? How quickly is something changing at a specific moment? And we, already discussed, I mean, this was long ago, you might not remember it super well, but we already discussed the formula for this. We'd introduced the formula though before we introduced to limits. So what we had to say was that to find the instantaneous rate of change, at x zero, you need to look at this fraction and then simplify it. And then I made some kind of vague comment about letting h get closer and closer to zero. Well, we can now state this in a much more formal way. To take the instantaneous rate of change, to find it, I should say, we take, let me move that up slightly. We take the limit as h approaches zero of this fraction. 
And the instantaneous rate of change is a mouthful. Uh, we'll get sick of uh, saying that phrase very quickly. So it gets its own name and it also gets its own notation. And because I wrote this too far to the left, let me center it. The limit as H goes to zero of F of X zero plus H minus f of x zero divided by h. The notation for this limit is as follows. f apostrophe. And then in parentheses, x zero. And the first thing you might think when you look at this is that that looks an awful lot like function notation. And you'd be completely correct. In the next section, we'll look at this from a function point of view. For now, this is just abstract notation. When you're talking out loud, this apostrophe is read as prime, F prime of X sub zero. And in terms of words, this is the derivative of f of x at x sub zero. And we are going to be spending basically the rest of this course looking at derivatives. How do you find them? How do you use them in applied problems? Questions like that. Um, the last two to three weeks might are something else, but we're going to be spending a lot of time on these. And for the most part, when we, um, when we need a derivative, we are not going to be using this definition. This definition is actually very difficult to work with. We'll find easier ways of finding derivatives. But since we have about 10 minutes left, Let's remind ourselves of how we did this. I mean, we have found derivatives before. We did not use that word. We used the phrase instantaneous rate of change. But if f of x is this quadratic, let's find f prime of two, just using the definition. And the definition says you should take the limit as h approaches, oh, I was right the first time as h approaches zero of f of two plus h minus f of two divided by h. 
And that's without doing any simplification. What is f of 2 plus h? Oh, it's 2 plus h squared minus 2 plus h plus 2. And what is f of 2? It's 4 plus 2 is 6 minus 2 is 4. And previously, I sort of joked, but I wasn't really joking, that finding limits is easy, except for finding the limits you care about, which is always harder. Um, notice that none of the nice limit rules we've learned actually work. Here. We can't use the quotient rule. If we do, we get zero divided by zero. That doesn't tell us anything. We can't use continuity. This function isn't, this fraction isn't defined at zero, so it's not continuous at zero. What we are going to do. is see if we can simplify this. We'll multiply everything out and subtract and do any cancellation and see if we can sort of beat this problem into shape. Four plus four H plus H squared. Uh, that's two plus eight squared, I foiled it. Minus two, minus h, plus two, minus four, all divided by h. And now rather than copy down step by step, I'm going to sort of start scribbling stuff out. We've got a plus two and we've got a minus two. And that cancels. And we have a plus four and we have a minus four. And that cancels. And we have a four H and we have a negative H and that doesn't totally cancel, but it does turn the 4H to 3H. Oof. Let's see if we can finish this up on this frame. It's the limit as H goes to zero. We pull an H out. of the top, that lets us cancel the H's in the top and the H's in the bottom. And now we can use continuity. Three plus zero is three. And is that what I was expecting? That is what I was expecting. The instantaneous rate of change at two is three. And this is kind of a toy problem, it has to be said. I mean, if you had a more complicated function than a quadratic, we probably wouldn't be able to find the derivative this way. Like if you, if you have f of x equals x e to the x, 
and you tried to find the derivative at x zero equals one. I mean, you would end up with a limit that you weren't a, that you will not be able to do anything with. Let's see what happens. So far, just like the quadratic, f of one plus h is one plus h times e to the one plus h minus one e to the one divided by h. And you can't use the quotient rule, you can't use continuity, you get division by zero errors if you do. And if you try to cancel stuff, it's no longer at all clear what you're going to do with that H in the denominator. It simply doesn't cancel with the stuff in the numerator. So we really need a way of finding derivatives that is not mucking around with difficult limits every time they show up. And starting next week, we're going to get that. We're going to be able to look at this and we're going to be able to say, Okay, to find the derivative at any x value, you take 2x minus 1 and plug the x value in. So stuff like this is not going to be the rest of the course. We'll spend some more time on this tomorrow, probably, and then never do anything quite like this again. But we will. This is, this is 3.1. 3.1 is a super short section, like two pages. I'm going to, I'm actually going to put the quizzes for this back a little so that you can study for the test and not feel like you need to be doing these quizzes too. So this quiz won't be due Saturday. It will maybe Monday evening or something. Thing, and I will see you all tomorrow.